Hello, everybody. Welcome to Data Umbrellas webinar. I'm going to do a brief introduction, and then I will hand the microphone and the screen share over to Melissa. And um, we will, at the end, open it up for questions and answers. And we please ask that you keep the questions on topic. And today's topic is contributing to SciPy. This is being recorded and will be on our YouTube, usually within 24 hours of this webinar. A little bit about Data Umbrella. We are a community for underrepresented persons in data science. We organize uh, data science events, and we are a nonprofit organization. Uh, I'm a statistician by training, and you can find me at Reshma S on Twitter, LinkedIn, and GitHub. We have a code of conduct, and we're dedicated to providing a harassment-free experience for everyone, and we thank you for helping to make this a welcoming, friendly, and professional community for all. There are various ways that you can support Data Umbrella. The first is to follow our code of conduct and contribute to making it a collaborative space where people want to keep coming back to. Uh, the next thing is that we have a Discord server and you can ask or answer general questions on there. You can share events and job postings and the link to the Discord server is on our website. Another way that you can support Data Umbrella is do to donate to our nonprofit. We are hosted by Open Collective, and um, our URL is opencollective.com slash data dash umbrella. We are also on Benevity, and so if you work for a company that uses Benevity, they have company-matched uh, donations. So if you donate $100, your company will also match it for $100. Uh, you, if you want, um, we recommend that you subscribe to our Data Umbrella YouTube channel. We have a whole series of webinars from the past two years there. Um, we have a playlist on career advice. We also have other playlists on contributing to open source, a PyMC series, a NumPy series, a Scikit-Learn uh, series. And uh, yeah, we, we uh, encourage you to check that out. We also have a monthly newsletter where we share about upcoming events, videos that have been posted, any announcements that we have for the community. And our monthly newsletter is dataumbrella.substack.com. And we only send uh, communications once a month, and we do not uh, sell your email address to any organizations. Our website, dataumbrella.org, has resources on lists of conferences, open source, guides to using inclusive language, and uh, we recommend you uh, check that out. We are on all social media platforms as Data Umbrella. The ones where we are the most active are Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, Meetup is the place to go to find out about upcoming events and sign up for them. YouTube is where our videos are posted. We have a blog, which I, I would say is very nice. So check out the blog.dataumbrella.org. And our newsletter, again, is dataumbrella.substack.com. We have live captioning on this webinar platform that we use, which is called Big Marker. If you go to the very top, there's CC for closed captioning, and you can pick the language. Uh, from what I hear, English is the best language for closed captioning. There are op options for other languages. Uh, we have a call for volunteers. Uh, we have, uh, as I mentioned, a library of videos, about 56 now. And so um, if you are available and interested, we would most graciously invite your help to add timestamps to the videos. And what these timestamps do is it makes it easier for viewers to get to the part of the video where they are most interested in. And also it helps potential viewers find the video based on their search terms. And I will share a link to that as well in the chat. And uh, we have a GitHub issue um, with a repo event dash transcripts data umbrella. And you can see examples and some instructions there as well. Uh, our next events for June are going to be Intro to Django on June 7th. And then on June 14th, we are having a data viz um, event. Today's talk is contributing to SciPy with Melissa Weber Mendonca. Melissa is an applied mathematician and former university professor turned software engineer. She works at Quantsight developing open source software and working on consulting projects. She has been involved with the Brazilian Python community for some time with a focus on outreach and education. She is a maintainer for NumPy, a contributor to SciPy, and believes in the power of open source contributions beyond code. You can find Melissa on Twitter at MelissaWM.
Um, if you'd like to share about our event, uh, feel free to tweet and tag at Data Umbrella on Twitter. And with that, uh, let's get started. Thank you so much, Reshma. Let me share my screen. Um, can you folks see my screen? Is that working? Yes, we can see the screen. I'm taking a screenshot for Twitter. There we go. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. So like Reshma said, my name is Melissa, and I will talk uh, today about contributing to SciPy. So we'll talk a little bit about SciPy's history, different ways to contribute to the project, and how the community is organized. If you want to follow along or save the slides for later, there's a couple of links in the slides that may be useful if you want to get started with contributions. You can find them with the link in the screen. Um, I believe we can also share this in the chat. Yes, I think Reshma just shared it. Thank you. Um, the main repository where SciPy code is stored is also listed there. So this is github.com slash SciPy slash SciPy. And you can find the documentation on SciPy.org. Okay, so first things first, I like to show this image every time I do a presentation because I feel like it takes away a lot of the anxiety around learning new things. And it's important to remember that nobody knows everything. Um, here in this image on the left, you can see what imposter syndrome feels like. It's a big circle with what I think others know, like they have this immense knowledge and a tiny circle of the things that I know. It looks impossible to learn um, so much. And indeed it is, because this image on the left, it's not real. This is not how the world works. Reality looks much more like the image on the right. We all know our own little circles, and they intersect in sometimes unexpected ways with what other people know. Nobody has the full picture but we can make up a lot of knowledge from parts of what everyone knows together. Um, so we'll work on what we can understand and not try to learn everything all at once. So what is SciPy? SciPy is a set of fundamental algorithms for scientific computing in Python. It includes routines for numerical integration, interpolation, signal processing, linear algebra, including eigenvalue problems, algebraic and differential equations, statistics and mathematical optimization, and others. It is based on NumPy arrays, which are the n-dimensional array structures that allow for fast computation in Python but it also includes support for some specific data structures, such as sparse matrices and k-dimensional trees. So this is a set of smaller libraries, you could say, uh, that work together to enable scientific computation in Python. So to tell you a little bit about the history of SciPy, its initial release can be traced back to 2001, uh, but its popularity may have come later. Uh, you can count over 600 unique code contributors over all of this time. There are thousands of dependent packages on SciPy, over 100,000 dependent repositories, and millions of downloads per year. So this is clearly a foundational project in the PyData ecosystem, and SciPy is used for a number of different things, going from scientific computing in a more academic set of applications, such as um, astronomy, or maybe uh, astrophysics, or maybe geology, or maybe meteorology, a, a number of different things in academic settings to a more um, industry setting, such as data science, machine learning projects, other kinds of statistics, optimization, um, really a number of different projects where it is used uh, by 
a large set of people. So it is a very impactful project in the sense that there are millions possibly of stakeholders. So I want to talk a little bit about how SciPy is organized. SciPy actually wraps highly optimized implementations of scientific algorithms written in low-level languages like Fortran, C, and C++. So there is a lot of Python code, but there are also other programming languages involved. As you can see in this image here, the image that I'm showing in the center of the slide is a screenshot of the GitHub stats showing that about 55% of SciPy is written in Python. Around 19% is written in Fortran, some 17% is written in C, and the rest is Cython, C++, and some configuration and building files making up the rest. Uh, we'll see a little bit how this works later, but I just wanna leave it as a thought that you can actually do a bunch of different things inside SciPy, both with Python and with other programming languages. If you wanna check about um, how this works, you can check the link that I left in the slides. The code and the documentation live in the same repository in GitHub, which is github.com slash scipy slash scipy. While the website, which is the main landing page and a few of the documents that you can find on scipy.org live in a separate uh, repository. SciPy has a basic teams structure and it is possible that these teams are expanded in the future. So this is something that we're still working on and something that we would love to have uh, new people join and kind of understand how we can better organize these teams in the future. You can find information about community meetings on scientificpython.org slash calendars. This page shows a lot of different meetings scheduled for different projects in the scientific Python ecosystem including SciPy. So currently we have one community meeting for SciPy, which happens every two weeks, and we alternate time zones to be able to reach more people. We are also scheduling our first newcomer meeting for this Friday, May 27th. So um, the information about this meeting will be at the calendar shortly. If it's not already, it's a PR that needs to be merged. And we would really welcome anyone who wants to join and learn more about the project and learn more about how they can contribute. So this is an invitation for those who want to join and start contributing. Okay, so given that introduction, I would like to go with you a little bit through the code, just because it is not obvious where everything is and how we can actually change things and figure out how to do our contributions. So if we go to this link, which is github.com slash scipy slash scipy, we can get to the GitHub repository where all of this code lives. And so I would like to give you folks a tour of this uh, repository and kind of show you where the different uh, code is organized. And so if you look at this uh, first folder, so this is the root folder where we land when we get to GitHub, there is a bunch of files, different files, um, that we don't need to necessarily worry about right now. A few are informational, such as, you know, citation, um, contributing, which lists uh, uh, links and ideas on how to contribute, install, which lists in installation, basic installation instructions, license, and that kind of thing. What we want to focus on is the actual code which lives under SciPy. So if we go to this folder, 
looking inside, we can see a bunch of the different submodules that make up SciPy. So as I explained to you before, SciPy is kind of a collection of different submodules that do uh, scientific computing operations and implement these algorithms for solving solution, uh, solving uh, different problems. And so if you look inside of this folder, you can see cluster, you can see constants, FFT, FFT pack, integrate, interpolate, and each one of these is actually a submodule for SciPy. So I would like to give you a first example, which is Linalt. So if we go to this submodule, uh, some people might be familiar with it, which is the linear algebra submodule. And so there are a few operations uh, for linear algebra and treating vectors and matrices and tensors that are defined here. So if we take a look inside of this folder, we can see that there are a bunch of different files, um, not only .py files, but .pyx, .pyi, .pxd. So we will talk a little bit about these kinds of files later but I just want to show you more or less how this is organized. And so if you look at this folder, there are a bunch of different files and it is not clear what is defined on each file. And this is fine. Um, like we say, and we say the same thing for NumPy, both NumPy and SciPy are projects with a huge history and a long time of development and a lot of people who have worked on it. And it is very difficult to kind of grasp the entirety of the project as one person. And so it is absolutely fine that you don't understand everything. Um, my recommendation is usually to go for the things that you use yourself. So if there are particular modules, particular functions that you are used to using in your work, or in your school projects or in your personal projects, those are the ones that you wanna focus on if you are trying to contribute. That kind of experience of understanding how these functions, modules, methods are used is what is going to give you the motivation and the understanding to make contributions to this project. So again, going down, we see a bunch of different kinds of sources um, files, and I'm going to go back to this later. So this is Linalge. If we go to another subfolder, for example, if we go to optimize, we have a different structure. So there's a lot of folders, a lot of PY files, and again, it is not immediately clear where everything is defined, but all of the functions and methods and applications for the SciPy optimize module are defined here. This is a um, quick, very quick tour of the SciPy subfolder, which contains the code. We could also look at the doc folder. This is where the documentation lives. So. This is where we will see, for example, if we go into the source folder, we will find all the RST files that define the documentation. So as many of the projects in the scientific Python ecosystem, SciPy gets its documentation formatted as restructured text files, which is the, the format that is native to Sphinx. Um, the framework that we use for generating the documentation. And so if you have questions about it, if you're not familiar with Sphinx, there are a few links that I can share later when we do the questions at the end. There's another video that I did for Data Umbrella in the past that also talks about using Sphinx for Python documentation so you can get more information on that. In any case, this is where you have all um, the source files. You can see here, there's a bunch of release.rst files, but if you go under each subfolder, for example, if you go to tutorials, you can find a few of the more specific tutorials on each 
of the submodules for SciPy. So this is where this documentation lives. Um, lastly, I wanted to talk a little bit. So going back to the root folder of the code and the repository that we're looking at, I would like to talk a little bit about the other folders that we find here. For example, there's a CI, there's a dot GitHub, there's a dot circle CI. Those folders usually deal with continuous integration and how we test that our changes actually work when we submit any changes to GitHub through pull requests, for example. And so these folders will usually deal with building, making sure that we build the documentation, making sure that all the tests are passing when we submit any changes to GitHub. So again, we'll talk a little bit about those later, but I just wanted to let you know what those are about. Um, I think this is uh, highlights of what is contained on the GitHub repo for SciPy. If you have any specific questions, if there's anything that is not clear, I'd be happy to answer questions later. So let me just go back to my presentation quickly. Cool, so now that you've seen the SciPy repo, um, how can you actually contribute? So there's a link there that I left, which is scipy.org slash contribute. And the information that I'm showing here comes mostly from that page. And it lists a couple of ways that you can actually contribute to SciPy. So um, as much as it is very common for people to value code contributions above all else, that is not all that you can do. So like Rishma said in my presentation, uh, in my introduction, sorry, um, I speak Portuguese and presentation and introduction are the same to me in Portuguese. Um, like Reshma said in my introduction, uh, I believe in contributing beyond code. So of course you can write code and submit your code contributions, but there are also other ways of contributing. For example, you can contribute by reviewing pull requests. Um, just looking at other people's code is a great way to learn. And having a fresh perspective on an implementation or even a practitioner's experience is very useful when reviewing code. Even summarizing a long discussion on a PR or an issue is extremely useful, particularly for discussions that have been lingering for some time in the repository, which is the case for many of our open issues and PRs. You can also help triage issues and PRs by checking if older bugs are still present, fighting duplicate issues and linking related ones, um, adding good self-contained reproducers to issues. They are all very valuable ways to contribute. These actions all take time and the people maintaining open source libraries are often too busy to go back to these older issues, but they would love to have that help. So it is truly a very nice way to contribute. You can also test any proposed changes, for example, new features that are proposed in PRs. Uh, so PRs are pull requests and uh, anything else that is discussed in the mailing list. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the mailing list in the end, but just so you know, that is the official forum where we discuss new features, big uh, policy changes, and any kind of implementation that requires a larger input from the community. Um, as a former teacher, I am very biased here, but I think we can't understate the value of developing good educational materials and documentation for any of these projects, um, any open source projects, really. We, in particular for SciPy, we have millions of users and any improvements that you do to documentation or educational content around uh, libraries like SciPy are extremely impactful work. You can suggest worked examples, Jupyter notebooks, tutorials, 
videos. Um, there's just a, a several different kinds of educational content that you can generate or help generate for sci-fi. Finally, we can also usually use help in website development, graphic design, fundraising in general. Um, even though these activities are often overlooked, it is super important to remember how vital they can be for any open source project. Having a great logo or accessibility in documentation and examples, um, making sure that you plan for sustainability, those are all key to having a successful open source project and SciPy is no different in that. Okay, so next I want to talk a little bit about the practical side of contributing. So first, I would like to talk a little bit about setting up your development environment. So what is this? From this link that I put in the uh, slides, you will get to this page, which is the contributors quick start guide for SciPy. So of course, this does not cover all of the different uh, development cases. Um, so if you have different setups, if you're working on a different architecture or a different operational system, you might need uh, specialized help. And you can find a link in the bottom of this document that lists all the different ways that you can set up your environment. But in general, what you want to do is use either Conda or some flavor of the many virtual environment management tools, such as VNV or any other kind um, of tool that you are used to, to set up your development environment. After you've set up an environment, you want to be able to build SciPy. Why do you need to actually build SciPy? So unlike pure Python projects, SciPy uses compiled code for speed, like I mentioned before. So there's a lot of C code, C++, or Fortran code that actually needs to be built into extension modules um, to be imported by SciPy. So this means you might need extra dependencies to complete this step, depending on your operational system. So if you're using Windows, if you're using Linux, or if you're using Mac, you might need to install extra dependencies. Finally, the third step is to perform your development tasks. So what are those? Um, these can include any changes that you want to make to the source code, any corrections, any bug fixing or enhancements or new features that you want to add, running tests, which are super important to make sure that uh, we keep backwards compatibility, that other people are able to use your code without generating new bugs, building the documentation in case you want to check locally that your changes work, running benchmarks, if that's the case, if you're working on performance or you want to check that your changes don't actually degrade the performance that's already there for SciPy, et cetera. So those are all the different uh, development tasks that you might want to perform uh, when contributing to SciPy. So if you look at the basic workflow, there's a guide on how to clone this project. So you might want to develop uh, your changes locally. This means that you want to clone this uh, repository, possibly fork it first, so that it shows up in your own GitHub profile, clone it locally to your machine, and then building and uh, setting up all the development uh, environment and different variables that you need to get that going. So if you go further in this page, you can find Conda instructions and you can also find PIP instructions, uh, PIP or VN instructions if that's the tool that you're mostly used to. However, I would like to show you another way. So if you are not interested or maybe unable to build and set up your development and environment locally, 
maybe because you have a, an older computer or because you have different needs uh, when it comes to building. For example, you might have a computer where you're not able to install any other extra dependencies. You may want to use Gitpod. Gitpod is a super nice tool that you can use to set up a development environment in your browser. And so I am going to show you pretty quickly um, how this is done for a sci-fi. If you click on this link that is shown on the slide, you will get to the documentation that we have for setting up your development environment using Gitpod. You can scroll down and see there are screenshots and detailed instructions on how to do this. I am going to quickly show you how this is done in practice. So once you install, so it is possible to install a browser extension either for Firefox or Chrome or whatever browser you are using uh, that enables this green button. So this is a Git pod button that shows up on your GitHub. Uh, you can see that this is my own fork of SciPy. So I'm inside Melissa WM slash SciPy. And if I click this Get Pod button, I get a development environment that is set up for me. So I'm going to show it in the next screen. Um, it is timed out because I had to open it before, um, but it was sitting for some time, so it times out, but you can always reopen it. And what Get Pod does is that it has a pre-set up development environment for you so that you don't need to set that up yourself locally. So if you're doing small changes, if you're doing things that are not too heavy in terms of computational costs, if you feel like you can wait a little bit for the tests to run, it may take a while, but at the same time, it is a pretty sure way to have your development environment set up so that you can start contributing more easily. I'm going to keep going and I can come back when Gitbot is set up. Uh, to show you how this works. So one of the questions that we get a lot when people start contributing is, I showed you like the complete folder structure for SciPy and the repository and where the code lives, but it is not immediately clear every time what file you should be editing. And so there are a number of generated or compiled files that are created when you build SciPy the first time or any time that you build it. And those don't need to be edited because when you rebuild SciPy, they will be overwritten by the new build. And so it is important to know if you are not familiar with these file extensions, a PYX file is a compiled uh, filed by Cython, uh, sorry, it is compiled by Cython into a C file. So um, the PYX file is something that you want to edit and not necessarily the C file. A PXD file is a header for Cython code. This is also going to be used to generate uh, C, C compiled code later. A PYF.SRC file, which is a number of the files that I showed you, for example, in the linear algebra submodule, is a signature file that is used to wrap Fortran files with F2Py. So this is more of a complicated uh, setup that you don't necessarily want to edit in the beginning, or at least not as a first contribution maybe, but it's important to know that these files are there and they are actually used to generate the final algorithms and everything that you are going to use for SciPy. There is another thing that I want to show you in the repo. So I mentioned here add new docs.py. What is this? If we go into SciPy, and we go, for example, um, into, sorry.
Yes, of course I cannot find it now. Um, ODR. Yes. So a few of the submodules for SciPy have this file called addnewdocs.py. So what is this file? This is actually what contains uh, doc strings for a few of the functions. So if you scroll down in this case for scipy.odr, you can see a few functions that have their doc strings here. All of this is not obvious, so it's not immediately clear that these are the files that you have to look for in order to change uh, the doc strings. So how do you figure out how to find uh, what to edit? Honestly, all of us that do any kind of development in these projects, I know that both for NumPy and for SciPy, grep is your friend. So if you are familiar with the grab command on Linux or any kind of uh, the, on Mac OS, that's also common. If you use a uh, Windows subsystem for Linux, that's also something that is there. This is a command that allows you to search inside the files in a folder for specific keywords and expressions and pieces of text. So what we do is usually pick up a piece of the code that we want to edit, use grep and then find the file where that code is contained. Honestly, I don't think there's a better way to do that. So that's my recommendation for you. The same goes for narrative documentation. Like I showed you, there are a bunch of files under the doc folder, the doc source folder, and those are what contain the narrative documentation, what we call the tutorials, the how to's, explanations and anything that is not auto-generated when SciPy is built. To find where to edit those files, I also recommend using grep and just figuring out where uh, the text that you want to edit lives. So once you have done your changes, Let's say that you figured out an issue and we can talk a little bit more about this in the end. You made your changes and you've decided that your work is complete. How do you see your changes actually come up either in the code or the documentation? You need to build SciPy. So like I said, unlike other pure Python uh, projects, you actually need to rebuild to see your changes done. And this is done for uh, using this command called python dev.py. So if we go again to the repo and we look at the main, the root folder, which is this one, there is a dev.py file. This is the script that gets everything going. So from this file, we can build we can do testing, we can build the documentation and all the other development operations that we want to do, any development tasks that we have to perform. We recommend that you use the dev.py setup. Now, this is a recent change. So recently, SciPy has been moving away from an old system using this tutorials. So it is possible that you face issues while compiling using dev.py. However, this is the recommended way to do it um, from now on. And so if you do find issues while compiling with dev.py, we encourage you to submit issues and report any bugs, any errors that you encounter to the project so that we can fix them. Again, you can do Python dev.py this will, at the same time, build and run all of the unit tests that we have for the project. So at the end of this command, you will have a full report of whether your changes work or not. If you just want to build but not run the tests, and this might be useful because the tests for SciPy take a long time to run. So if you just want to build as you are developing your uh, changes, you can do python dev.py slash uh, dash dash build dash only. So that's the way to build without running the tests. 
Specifically, if you want to build the documentation, again, you are going to use Python dev.py dash dash doc. This will build all of the documentation for a consultation uh, locally so that you can check your changes. You don't necessarily have to do this every time. If you are not changing documentation, if your issue, your PR, if the changes that you're doing don't affect the documentation, you don't necessarily have to run this every time. All of these commands are actually run when you submit your pull request to GitHub. So if there are any problems, you can definitely see them later. So um, this will be, you don't necessarily have to run uh, these locally. Cool, so let's say you chose an issue, you did your changes, you built locally or either the code or the documentation and you want to submit your pull request. How do you do that? Are there any specific rules that you need to follow? Um, so there are a few guidelines that we ask you to follow. For example, for the commit messages, we do have some guidelines. So I'm going to show you very quickly. Um, and the link that I'm showing in the slides points to this page. And so this is a guide on writing the commit message. So we ask you that commit messages are clear and follow a few basic rules. For example, you want to do a short description in the first line and then any further uh, specific description that you have, you can do in the following lines of the commit message. We also ask that you use a prefix. So in this case, you can see three letters, E and H, this stands for enhancement. If you scroll a little bit down, there's a list of the different acronyms that we use as a prefix for commit messages. We ask that you follow this um, just for clarity. And later when we check the log of commit messages, it makes it that much clearer to understand what was done in each commit, commit and PR. Um, so this is a, a important guideline to follow. So after you submit your pull request, you do your commit message, um, what happens? Next comes the review. And so other people, uh, specifically maintainers, possibly other contributors, are going to be reviewing your code and any other changes that you submit in your pull request. Code reviews and pull request reviews should be constructive and friendly. Uh, back and forth are expected. So please don't feel discouraged if that happens. If you look at the history of pull requests that we have for the repository, it is normal to have conversations, questions, and kind of back and forth understanding what other people are doing. And so we can help you complete your PR. So if there are stages where you submit your PR, there's a code review that you don't really understand, you need some clarity, you need to ask questions to be able to move forward, you can feel free to ask and people will help you get uh, those things done. And so uh, it is normal to have that kind of back and forth in pull request reviews. As you are submitting your pull requests, like I said, there's going to be a bunch of checks that are going to be run against any code that you do, that you send, any changes. Uh, so I'm going to show you an example, and it is the link that is uh, listed here in the slide. It is this one. So I just picked one randomly. It's not any special uh, thing about this. But if you do scroll down, you can see that there is some code review. And at the end, there is a bunch of checks. And it says 18 successful and two failing checks. So this is what's going to happen if you submit a pull request. And for some reason, your code either doesn't work on a specific architecture or maybe it has trouble with the documentation. Uh, maybe there is some issue that you didn't expect because when you run the tests locally, you can only verify that your code works on your kind of machine, your architecture, your operational system. And so to be able to make sure that this will work for every architecture, every operational system that we support, 
we have this list of checks that runs in continuous integration, which is CI. And so again, don't feel discouraged if your tests don't pass. In this case specifically, you can see that there are two tests failing. If you scroll up a little bit, Pumfuel says CI failure seems related. Um, this means that yes, probably one of the changes that you did is showing up in those failures. It could be that they say also CI failure seems unrelated. It happens sometimes that you have CI failures which are not related to your changes. So that's why the maintainers are there to kind of review your code and make sure that these are all valid and will keep working for other users when they use these changes later. Cool, so I'm nearing the end of the talk. So I have a few final thoughts that I wanted to leave you folks with. Um, first is I invite you all to check out scipy.org slash community. Um, that's where you have a bunch of resources, a bunch of uh, links that you can follow to kind of get involved in the community, start contributing and understand how the community is organized. Um, I also invite you to join our mailing list. The link is there in scipy.org slash community. And that is where most of the communication happens now. And so um, I invite you to join and maybe look around and see how the discussions happen. And maybe if you have thoughts, if you have suggestions, if you have ideas for improvements, that's where you can uh, speak your mind. Then I also ask you to check out scientificpython.org slash calendars. Like I said, that's the place where we list all of our events. So community and the new newcomer meetings that are coming up. Uh, first one that we're going to have is this Friday. So I invite you all to join if you are able. If you are not, please tell me. Um, you can get in touch with Twitter. You can write me. My email is melissawm at gmail.com. And I can paste this in the chat as well. Um, and I'd be happy to discuss with you a different time zone that works for you. This is something that we are trying to figure out is how to fit as many time zones as possible for our meetings and making sure that we include everyone or at least as many people as we can. Finally, I left you with a link of good first issues. So if you click on this link, you will go to SciPy and you can see a list of good first issues that you can maybe work on. So those are the ones recommended for newcomers um, just because in general, they are more self-contained and we already have an idea of how to solve it. That doesn't mean that you cannot work on other issues. These are just a little bit easier, maybe uh, in the eyes of the maintainers. However, if you find other issues that you're interested in, uh, please make sure to mention in the comments that you would like to work on them. If you need help, we can help you. And I am also at Melissa WM on GitHub. So you can feel free to tag me if you have questions, if you have, if you have any uh, needs, if you need help with reviews, anything really. So this is what I had to say. Thank you so much, Reshma, and I am open for questions. Melissa, thank you so much for a fabulous presentation. Um, can you hear me okay? Good. Yes, I can. Should I stop sharing? Uh, um, it's okay. You can leave the, the um, I, I, yeah, I guess you could sh stop sharing. Uh, either way. Um, yeah, so if anybody has any questions, we have some time. This is a great opportunity to um, to ask. I, I see that we already have a volunteer who's going to do the timestamps for the video. So that's great. Thank you. Um, that shows that there definitely is a lot of enthusiasm. And um, if anybody has, I know one person said that they are looking forward to um, working on a pull request. Um, so yeah, you know, this is a great opportunity if you have any questions for Melissa. This would be a first, no questions. 
Maybe, Maybe my your, presentation was too good. <laughs> it was so comprehensive that nobody has any questions. Um, I like guess I so said, I'm happy to take questions later as well. If you want to get in touch through Twitter or through email, I'm happy to answer questions later as well. I think you were muted. Okay, okay there we go. Um, can you just, if you have a date, when is the next uh, SciPy community meeting again? The next SciPy community meeting is tomorrow. Ooh. And the next uh, newcomer meeting, which is going to be the first for SciPy, is on Friday. Um, ah, okay. This is the community. Yep. And then the, okay, cool. And, you know, I guess I have a question that maybe you could um, help answer is, can you talk a little bit about the conference SciPy? I remember when I first heard about the conference, which is probably back in 2017, I really didn't know what the conference was about. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, so SciPy the conference is not related to SciPy the project, which is very confusing. Um, but I think it all started out started off as the same thing or at least the community was the same but then the PyData ecosystem or the scientific computing and python became such a larger project in terms of different specific projects to solve uh you know different academic fields problems and so the scipy conference remains as a big forum to gather scientists, software engineers, just people working on different open source projects related to what we call the PyData stack or a scientific Python. Um, so the SciPy conference is larger than SciPy the project. However, it is the community, there's a lot of overlap in the community. So if you want to hear about new things about uh, these open source projects, new directions, um, different implementations, uh, where people think they're going in the future. I think that's where the SciPy conference shines, is kind of getting these people together in the same room and talking about these things. Um, so yeah, I don't know if I can say more in terms of SciPy the conference. Uh, do you have specific questions? Um, not specifically. I, I think I did used to think that the SciPy conference was the SciPy library. So yeah. um, sort of clearing that up in my head. Um, the other question that I had was about SciPy is it consists of all it's like, there's a lot of other libraries such as matplotlib and pandas and numpy that are related. Um, maybe, you know, if you want to talk a bit about the um, I know that there's there's a grant and some work coming up mm -hmm. so that these libraries can sort of best like optimally function as you know they sometimes they work as independent projects but actually what one library does has a significant impact on another library so if you want to sort of talk about you know what's happening with that yeah i can talk a little bit about this um like the interaction between these libraries so uh, definitely we have a lot of overlap in maintainers and we also have a lot of overlap and in interests in the sense that, of course, like you said, anything that happens to NumPy may have an impact on Pandas, on Matplotlib, on SciPy, and vice versa. Um, so recently, we did receive a grant from CZI, which is the Chen Zuckerberg Initiative, to work uh, as a joint uh, grant for NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, and Pandas towards improving onboarding new contributors, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion for these four projects, and kind of understanding what works and what doesn't um, when we want to improve the situation for these projects in the terms of, uh, you know, like, and talk before about DEI specifically. So we wanna make sure that we have space, that we have um, resources, dedicated to onboarding people, especially those from underrepresented groups, and that we have um, specific documentation, 
that we have ideas on uh, how to make sure that people feel welcome, how to make sure that they feel included, and how they can understand how to contribute to these different projects. So the four projects are different. They have different organizational structures, they have different governance, and they have different contribution um, workflows. But in a sense, they are also very similar. And it is um, common that people start contributing to one of the projects and end up contributing to others. And so this grant is also an opportunity to kind of get those ideas together, understand what we can make consistent across the four projects. Um, so overall, I just think it's an amazing opportunity to onboard new people and make sure that we understand how to streamline contributions for people who want to get started. Yes, yeah, so like I said, um, I, I see that you mentioned this in the chat, Rishma. I think the newcomer meeting hasn't been added to the calendar yet. I have a PR up for that. It might be merged later today. Uh, it will definitely be announced in the mailing list. So if you join the mailing list, you have all the information that you need. So all of the announcements, any meetings, events that happened around SciPy are also announced in the mailing list. So if you want to make sure, you can just join there and and check those messages. Do you have a link to the mailing list? <clears throat> yes, I do. Okay. If you, I'm going to paste it in the chat. Here you go. Great. Bye yeah. bye, Dev. Great. All right. And with that, I want to thank you so much for uh, doing this presentation. And we will be adding it to our playlist of contributing to open source. And um, it really is, even though somebody else is going to be doing the timestamps, I will be watching this again. <laughs> Awesome. I do have one final note, which is I see in the chat, there's a question by Lucy. Do you have any advice for people in Latam to contribute more to open source? And I do. Um, please look for meetups or groups or any communities close to you uh, that speak the same language that are doing similar things and connect to other people. Like working in a group is extremely helpful when you're doing this kind of thing. So if it's PyLadies, if it's any kind of SciPy uh, group or any kind of meetups that you have close to you, if you get to connect to other people from your region working, it's usually helpful. And if you need help with that, you can be in touch with me, send me an email or a message on Twitter, and I can definitely connect you to other people in Latin America. Great. Thank you so much for catching that question that I missed. Um, and with that, yeah, the video is going to be up in about 24 hours. And thank you so much for joining us.